Good evening and uh, welcome to a very interesting session that we are hosting uh, with some of us joining from uh, various parts of India and others joining in from COP26 in Glasgow. We've had a very exciting COP26 for India with the Honorable Prime Minister announcing some very ambitious targets for India, culminating with India reaching net zero by 2070. Now, to shed light on how India can get there and what might be the opportunities and challenges uh, as we seek to move towards a net zero decarbonization pathway, uh, we have with us today uh, an extraordinarily uh, talented set of speakers, some, as I said, joining us from India uh, and others from uh, COP26. Uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Kelly Gallagher, from the Climate Policy Lab at uh, Tufts University. Uh, we have Ulka Kelkar uh, from the World Resources Institute. I believe she's in Bangalore. Uh, Kelly, of course, is at COP26. Uh, we have uh, Manat Jaspal uh, from ORF, uh, who uh, will be speaking uh, on some of the economics and financial issues associated uh, with this transition. Uh, Akhilesh Tilotia joins us from Mumbai, where he will be giving us his views uh, on uh, how to finance uh, this extraordinary green transformation. Uh, he is at uh, the National uh, Investment and Infrastructure Fund. Uh, we have uh, Sirish Sinha uh, from uh, CIF, uh, who uh, will be talking to us about how uh, this transition uh, towards a green future can be just and equitable. Uh, and we have Chandabhushan, uh, who is also uh, at COP26, and he will be discussing uh, what a just transition for India could look like, particularly as uh, we move uh, the coal economy uh, towards uh, a much greener future. Uh, so as I said, we have an outstanding lineup of speakers. Uh, we will be uh, focusing on three different uh, important topics, which uh, each of the speakers uh, will, be, uh, will be highlighting through their presentation. Uh, the first topic, uh, which will be discussed uh, by Kelly uh, and by Ulka will be India's decarbonization pathways. How can India, in fact, get to net zero? Uh, what will be uh, the shape of the decarbonization trajectory? Uh, and that uh, will be the first uh, set of presentations that we will have. Uh, then uh, we have uh, a number of speakers who will talk to us about how to pay for it. That's Akhilesh. Uh, Renita and Manat will talk to us about that. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, Shirish uh, and, of course, Chandabhushan uh, speaking to us about uh, how to have a just and equitable transition. So our presentations are really grouped uh, under these three topics. But we have uh, a wonderful keynote uh, that uh, uh, Sri Jamshed Godridge uh, will be uh, starting us off with. Uh, and, of course, he has been one of the pioneers uh, of uh, green and sustainable uh, economics and uh, transformation in India. And so we are very, very pleased uh, to have Sri Jamshed Godridge with us uh, to give us his perspective uh, on how India should shape its green future and undertake a green transformation. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us uh, uh, this evening, uh, Mr. Godridge, uh, and uh, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Jayant. Uh I think Mr. Jayan Sinha's uh, leadership uh, has been very instrumental in bringing all of us uh, together here. And I do want to thank ORF also for uh, putting all this uh, together. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, Shakti Foundation, WRI, and Dr. Kohli, and so many others have worked on uh, these ideas on decarbonization. And I'm so pleased uh, to uh, have such a distinguished panel uh, to uh, be on this uh, program today. So let me uh, just say that, uh, you know, I'm really thrilled, uh, like everyone else is, that India has stepped up to the plate with a 2070 uh, uh, net zero target. Uh, I think that uh, there will, of course, be some uh, critics who will say that 50 years is a long time. But I think we have to recognize that India is a country uh, that can uh, really move uh, in, a, in a slow and measured way. But I think in order for us to do that, we certainly have to make sure that, uh, you know, that we can plan properly. And I think that the most interesting part of our Prime Minister's uh, interventions at COP26 was the fact that the 2030 NDCs, 
were so, uh, I think they were so adequately and ambitiously uh, uh, pronounced. Uh, I think the, you know, I think one of the things that's always critical is that what are we going to do this year? What are we going to do next year and the year after that? And 2030 really puts a very, very tight lens on what we need to do, uh, not just on renewables, but on all the other uh, NDCs that were announced. I, my personal view is that uh, you know we have to focus a lot on nature-based solutions. And so to that extent, I would have been really happy to see much more uh, progress on deforestation uh, issues. You know, uh, I think that uh, the report that I have uh, seen is that we have not uh, signed up to the deforestation pact, but I'm st I think that's something that should be a work in progress for us. Uh, there is no way that you can achieve a net zero target without making sure that carbon sinks are adequately in place and forests are the most uh, appropriate for that. I think the other big challenge for India is going to be agriculture and methane. Uh, there's no doubt at all in my mind that uh, you know, these are uh, some of the big issues that we have to tackle. And as Jayant uh, you know, represents uh, his constituency, which is essentially uh, heavily based on coal, and he knows those issues a lot better than all of us do. Uh, and I think that the, this 2070 net zero target puts a lot of legitimacy on all of us talking about how we can plan for a coal-free future. You know, uh, this is important. It's, it's because it's about the economy. It's about jobs. It's about something that I think India can be really happy and proud of. Uh, I'm glad that, of course, uh, you know, we have, uh, have, we have a hydrogen mission in place. And interestingly, I've noticed that uh, there's been a lot of talk on nuclear energy again. And, uh, you know, we have to really study the legitimacy of nuclear energy uh, in this whole mix. And India, of course, has a very tiny amount of nuclear energy so far, but there is scope. There is certainly scope for a little more. And we know that lots of other countries in the world uh, are, are going to rely more on nuclear energy, while some have decided that uh, uh, that's enough for them. They don't want any more nuclear energy. But I think we certainly uh, should be looking at all the options available to us. And uh, my, my, my plea is that Jayanth, that uh, in parliament, uh, you know, that this is discussed a lot more. I think uh, it's important that people uh, through our parliamentary system know more about these issues. And, and can participate more in these issues. Uh, I think that's really important. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, I think we have to plan. And uh, the planning has to be some sort of a bipartisan commission. Uh, it can be housed, uh, whether in Niti Aayog or in some new uh, form of uh, governance uh, that we need. But we certainly need something because we all know that in India, we have many ministries we have many agencies and uh, we don't want uh, this attention to get diffused. I think if we can have a uh, focus on how to bring everybody together, not just the powers ministry or the renewable energy ministry, you know, everybody's involved. Uh, and, and this is about the economy. It's about jobs. It's about progress. And, and we need, you know, the mainstream economy whether it is to do with banking, it's to do with finance, everybody needs to be part of this uh, progress and solution. So Jayant, I think uh, we have a very tight program, I know for, the, for doing this with so many speakers in one hour, so I will not use up all my time, uh, but I think it's important uh, that it becomes an all of the economy and all of society involvement in this uh, transformation. Uh, that's really essential. I, th I think that if we don't take everybody along with us, you know, we will fail along the way. And so we really do need to uh, focus on the here and now and keep in mind the fact that we are happy that we have a net zero target. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sri Godrej. And I think uh, you have uh, 
uh, laid out uh, some very important and compelling perspectives through your keynote address, uh, specifically the one at the end that you mentioned about how to put a commission together to actually take this on uh, so that all stakeholders are fully represented. Uh, I think it is something that all of us as policymakers uh, do need to reflect on, and I'm sure there's going to be, uh, you know, excellent debate on institutionally uh, what we need to do. Uh, with that, let me now turn to Professor Gallagher from the Climate Policy Lab at Tufts University. Uh, she and her team have done some outstanding work in modeling uh, India's decarbonization pathways, uh, and uh, would be would be very interesting uh, to hear from you, Professor Gallagher, what uh, you have found uh, through the modeling work you've undertaken over the last year or so. Well, thank you very much. I'm here at the COP and uh, apologies in advance for the <laughs> chaos behind me in the screen. Um, but it has been a very interesting time. And as always, you know, the announcements and the deals that come together when you're finally here, you know, are in fact very important uh, to setting the direction of travel. And I think that Prime Minister Modi's new announcement uh, does exactly that. It creates a, a very important, clear direction of travel for India. And of course, all the details now will really matter in terms of how India gets from here to there. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen and just showing you a few of our modeling results on the policy pathways for India to get from its current state to net zero while having benefits for the economy. So let me just share. Okay, and I wanted to quickly acknowledge all of the people who have been working on this on this work. Um, Isran, there are Simhan, Tarun Gopalakrishnan, who's actually sitting here next to me, Megan Mahajan and Ravi Orbis as well. And we've had a lot of dialogue with Jayant Sinha who has been provoked many questions that have improved, that has greatly improved uh, the, the work we've done here. So I think the policy challenge uh, that we set for ourselves prior to Prime Minister Modi's announcement uh, was whether India could achieve deep decarbonization, if not net zero by 2050, and what the policy gap for India is for achieving that deep decarbonization, and which policies would be necessary for India to sustain or even increase economic growth and job creation. So how can we achieve that social justice as well as emissions reduction goals compared with business as usual? Uh, we defined deep decarbonization going into this as at least a 50% reduction below 2050 business as usual. And uh, very briefly, the method we used was to do a very comprehensive policy inventory of all of India's existing climate policies. Then we did a survey of Indian experts to find out what they thought, uh, which policies they believed were working, which weren't, and what types of policies might be needed going forward. And based on that, we developed a number of different scenarios to plug into a model that we developed with energy innovation I mean, you can see the link here. It's an open access model, so anyone can go and download it um, and, and play with it themselves. So the policy pathways that we used was business as usual, the expert elicitation scenario, and what we call the raising ambition scenario. And there we sought to maximize job creation through decarbonization policies. Um, so the raising ambition scenario reduces greenhouse gas emissions 70% below business as usual by 2050, uh, as you can see in this graph. And I'm having trouble moving. Uh, we uh, find very positive economic impacts, and I'll explain why uh, in just a minute. Um, so first of all, we get 46 million more jobs than the business as usual scenario, which is a substantial share of the 800 million person workforce that's expected to exist in 2050. We have a modest positive impact on GDP above business as usual. And of these new jobs, 31% of them would be in agriculture, 35% um, in manufacturing and 36% in services. Fiscally, and this is I think a very important consideration for Indian policymakers, 
we find that a carbon price is necessary uh, for both decarbonization and revenue generation. Um, car the carbon price becomes revenue neutral by mid-century. So in, in our scenario, the carbon tax starts at, at zero and rises to about $80 per ton, US dollars per ton. But what we're doing is shifting the taxes. So instead of we're shifting or reducing corporate taxes, we're reducing payroll taxes, we're reducing the deficit and we're increasing general spending with the use of this uh, carbon tax revenue. Um, so we, th this is how this all becomes positive um, in, in, the, in the scenario we modeled. And um, crucially, a very comprehensive uh, mix of policies is required uh, to achieve these very positive outcomes. So no single policy alone will get us where we need to go. Uh, for example, you can see the carbon tax, which is the purple, doesn't result in substantial emissions reductions, but the carbon tax turns out to be very important for revenue generation to help pay for all the other policies that are very important to achieving the goals. Uh, so we have a, a, if you look, think about it from a sectoral point of view, a transportation policy wedge that's comprised of uh, fuel economy standards, incentives for electric vehicles, and so forth. So I don't have time to go into all of the details, uh, but I just really, the point of this slide is to show that we'll need a very comprehensive mix of policies to achieve this transition. So I'll close with the policy implications. Uh, first, we don't see a viable path to deep decarbonization and now on to net zero by 2070 without an ambitious carbon pricing policy or international climate finance. Prime Minister Modi put a very important figure on the table in his speech here of needing the developing world needing a trillion dollars. In fact, I think it's much higher than that. Um, so we do need to find ways to mobilize the climate finance. Second, incentivizing mature cost competitive solutions, setting ambitious targets, making ambitious bets and in innovation coupled with industrial policy will get us where we need to go. And we certainly need to shift subsidies from mature technologies over time towards the new, uh, the new technologies so that we can decarbonize the hard to abate activities. And we do find in outer years that currently um, we, we forecast it will be challenging um, to, to get at some of the industrial sector uh, activities. Key policies for each sector in electricity, we need to mobilize renewables and storage deployment combined with a, a coal phase out over time, thinking carefully about that just transition. In transport, we need to have a modal shift, EVs for personal use and hydrogen for freight. And in industry, uh, we see a, a clear need to move towards green hydrogen solution and reducing process emissions and using carbon capture and storage. And with that, I'll thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gallagher. That was very interesting uh, to see uh, that net zero is in fact net positive for India. Uh, and uh, I know that Ulka and her team uh, have also uh, modeled uh, many different decarbonization pathways. Uh, Ulka, what have you all found uh, in your analysis? Well, thank you so much, Mr. Sinha. And thank you so much to the ORF team for the opportunity to present our work in this monograph and issue brief that they're bringing out today as well as to speak in this event. Um, I'm really presenting this on behalf of the entire team at WRI India, Shakti Foundation, Dr. Renu Kohli, and indeed Energy Innovation, uh, with whom we developed the Energy Policy Simulator for India. So uh, I would encourage all of you to go to this website, india.energypolicy.solutions, India and really explore your own scenarios. Uh, the model is only up to 2050, but it's a very powerful model. I'll just give you an example right now. For example, if you wanted to look at the um, emissions from the power sector and you know, just the kinds of um, announcements that the prime minister made as of 2030, um, and you can see that just this 500 gigawatts that he spoke about, the cost minimization where renewable energy wins out against coal to a, coal to a large extent, you see the power sector emissions flattening out 
by 2030 already. That's a really important thing for the country like India. Our power sector emissions are not going to go on increasing exponentially. So let me just also speak a little bit about uh, some of the other insights from this model. As Kelly said, there is no single silver bullet. So not only do we need systems modeling, we also need systems thinking, the kind of whole of economy approach that Mr. Godrich spoke about. Second, there are very crucial early decisive actions that are required that will play out at the back end. They may not be so visible at the front end. And the example of that is this carbon-free electricity standard. The closest to that in India that we have right now is an RPO, a renewable purchase obligation. And what it does is that when our EVs scale up, that means the electric vehicles are powered by clean electricity. When our industry scales up green scales of hydrogen for the decarbonization that's needed in the industrial sector, that hydrogen will come from clean energy. So it's really going to be important to use our existing policies very powerfully. We will also need to introduce some new policies. And here is the example of the carbon tax, which is important for three reasons. One, it will stimulate shifts to cleaner fuels, cleaner technologies, and spur innovation. Second, and very crucial for a country like India, where the central government derives 25%, a quarter of its tax revenue from fossil fuels, and we see in various decarbonization scenarios, the assumptions don't matter. As I said, you can make your own scenario. But the moment you have a shift away from cleaner fuel, uh, towards cleaner fuels, the tax revenue that you derive from fossil fuels is going to decline. So you need to offset that with a carbon tax, progressively increasing, expanding to include more sectors, process emissions, and that will put in the hands of the government the money that it needs for the crucial investments in the social sectors, in education, and in health. And finally, you need a carbon tax to stimulate induced jobs. So there will be definitely, in whichever scenario you look at, whichever climate action scenario you look at, it is better than the business as usual in terms of creation of jobs. These will be direct jobs as the economy electrifies, but there will also be induced jobs stimulated as a result of more spending, more investments, and more tax revenue in the hands of government. So let me just end with that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Ulka. Let me just ask you a quick follow-up question, which is as you have done the modeling uh, over the last year, what is it about the modeling that has been most surprising to you? You've explored a number of deep decarbonization pathways. Uh, what has surprised you the most? I think the most surprising was that, they expected, that I expected there to be a penalty. I expected it to be environment at the cost of development. And it was a pleasant surprise to find that that need not be the case. It, you can have clean environment and development. And that has always been this idealist environmentalist dream. But the very hard modeling based on government data, based close to government scenarios, just shows that and, and it's hard to refute. So your, your biggest surprise was that net zero is net positive. <laughs> yes, I have to admit it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, uh, when I have looked through the models uh, that have been put together, both by uh, Professor Gallagher's team uh, from uh, the Climate Policy Lab and the WRI World Resources Institute modeling, for me, the biggest surprise actually was the uh, the number of lives saved uh, from air pollution uh, that is triggered by fossil fuels. I'm sitting in Delhi right now, which is uh, uh, suffering terribly from air pollution. Uh, and the idea that we'll have clean blue skies like we saw during the lockdown, uh, if uh, we are able to eliminate fossil fuels, is something that at this time of the year, I think uh, would be a very pleasant prospect. Well, thank you very much. And uh, that concludes a little section uh, on deep decarbonization pathways uh, and how we've done the modeling. Let me turn to a very important question uh, of how we pay for this. Uh, and first I'd ask uh, Renita uh, to talk about, uh, you know, uh, the green taxonomy work uh, that you've done. Uh, thank you, you, Mr. Sina. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, India has delivered its Panchamitra, Pancha, Pancha, Panchamrit at, uh, against climate change at COP26. This has significantly raised our climate ambition, uh, requiring several billions, in fact, trillions of dollars in investment. However, the investment peculiarities of green projects do not allow them to align with the risk return profile uh, demanded by con conventional financial institutions. Uh, 
the high risk perception of india as an emerging economy uh, dampens its ability to secure environmentally conscious green finance uh, this situation can be partly remedied by inter introducing a green taxonomy which addresses the issue of greenwashing in associated with green finance this has motivated the paper on green taxonomy um this paper provides its readers a glimpse of some of the salient features present in the existing uh, taxonomies which can be incorporated into the indian version uh, the paper also provides a five point action plan an illustrative rule book which uh, policy makers can refer to while developing the taxonomy first focus on the most uh, pressing environmental challenges confronting india second develop the taxonomy across high impact sectors agriculture manufacturing transport power waste and buildings develop technology agnostic criteria uh, for eligibility of green finance so that the green taxonomy is not rendered redundant in the face of innovations and at the same time it allows you to uh, pursue uh, a green pathway of your choice uh, fourth accommodate and take into consideration specific domestic circumstances and fifth align the uh, taxonomy with national norms and standards the paper also develops um uh, certain uh, recommendations for uh, developing an ecosystem required for uh, supporting the implementation of the taxonomy and these recommendations are along three dimensions one improvement of the existing compliance culture as far as industrial uh, pollution norms and environmental impact assessment is concerned uh, upgrade uh, existing norms and create new ones where uh, none exist and three minimizing certain greenwashing risks that may occur while implementing uh, the green taxonomy these are the key takeaways of my green taxonomy paper thank you very much Thank you uh, very much, Renita. And with that, uh, let's turn now uh, to uh, Mihir uh, Sharma from ORF. Uh, Mihir, you've uh, looked very closely uh, at uh, some of the issues associated uh, with, uh, you know, climate finance as well. Uh, what, what, what are you finding? How do you assess uh, what has been happening at COP twenty six? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sinha, and uh, um, thank you once again to all the panelists for participating on this. Um, I, I, I think that um, when we're at COP26, uh, um, I mean, I'm, you know, which all of us are emotionally at the moment, um, I think it's uh, important uh, for us to recognize that in the end, um, the fight against uh, climate change and particularly the attempt to create a global uh, uh, pathway uh, towards carbon neutrality, as the IPCC, as the science recommends, um, has to be a truly global fight. So while I think I'm glad that we have set a, uh, a target for ourselves in, in India in 2070, and of course I appreciate that several other countries have also set net zero targets, uh, we have to recognize, and, and this is the, uh, uh, the main theme of of my contribution to this compendium, uh, Mr. Senna, we have to recognize that national targets are inherently insufficient. They don't necessarily add up to a global uh, uh, global target. It's the intersection of these very of these various pathways that we have to look at more closely. And one of the ways in which that intersection is managed is through finance, because finance essentially will have to flow across jurisdictions if globally we are to achieve a deep, deep, deep decarbonization pathway. One of the problems, I think, um, uh, as it stands with the Paris Agreement is that um, it is created problematic incentives for uh, domestic policymakers because um, for your own national, uh, for your own NDCs, you can increase domestic spending on programs that may address climate change but also create on a larger scale, perhaps, co-benefits that are politically palatable. And 
efforts such such as this in uh, uh, you know such as green new deals domestic green new deals particularly in better off high emissions economies don't always take into account the capital requirements of the rest of the world and we just heard uh, from professor gallagher that you know uh, in, uh, climate finance is one of the you know a scale up in international climate fa- finance is essentially a prerequisite for many of the pathways that she's been modeling um so climate change global carbon neutrality has to be the aim but domestic green new deals that don't address the costs of carbon abatement in the developing world or in fact which make these costs higher aren't exactly um, in a global sense steps towards uh, uh, um, uh, neutrality in fact they could make the costs of, of carbon abatement in the developing world higher some of these net zero plans uh, for in in the developed world because essentially they could crowd out uh, they they suck up a lot of the available finance and crowd out the possibility of some of, of much of that finance crossing national borders towards the geographies where they might have the most bang for their buck in terms of carbon abatement um so therefore you know the structural focus it has to may of, of of many current domestic efforts may be misplaced national targets and national efforts have to be supplemented by ensuring the flow of capital across national boundaries support for decarbonization efforts in the economies that simultaneously are least able to afford it and where high carbon growth trajectories uh, look most attractive and so essentially if you're talking about green new deals which a lot of us are uh, you know in india and across the world uh, we have to recognize that there can only be one green new deal and it has to be global thank you thank you very much me just a quick follow up question uh, if you are talking about a global green new deal uh, what do you think is an appropriate governance or institutional arrangement that will enable that to happen um you know uh, mr sinha then i i recognize that many people have questions about uh, the unfcc going forward and as as you know we have in global governance with any form uh, of multilateral uh, arrangement that requires uh, consensus you know uh, uh, we in india have a very particular uh, attitude to this kind of thing which I, you know better than anyone uh, how we eventually got uh, indian states to si- sign on to value added taxes uh, you create a group of people that do it you demonstrate its advantages and then you you wait for more people to sign on so i think that a lot of people and you yourself have talked about this in the past are looking again at uh, questions that were raised maybe 6 7 or 8 years ago uh, by economists such as william nordhaus on the on, on the possibility of creating a, a small group of fast movers not necessarily fast movers in terms of the pace of their decarbonization but fast movers in integrating perhaps the price of their carbon perhaps the nature of their markets but fast movers in integrating these questions and i think that that is one way in which we can be- make these steps towards creating a genuinely global deal thank you uh, mihir so what you are arguing for is that there should be uh, a climate club perhaps uh, which has an agreed upon green taxonomy as uh, renita was saying earlier so that uh, there are common and shared standards that enable uh, investments uh, across the club Uh, and that you think will be in some ways the shape of uh, a green new deal so interesting provocative idea uh, with that let's turn to the person who has the biggest checkbook here which is uh, uh, akhilesh tilotia from uh, nif uh, akhilesh do you like this idea of the climate club what what do you see uh, is going to be required to get uh, this trillions of dollars of capital to flow uh, to and to enable this green transformation to happen thank you uh, for having me here thank you mr sanha for uh, this question also uh, i think uh, from the perspective of an investment firm that nif represents uh, one of the things that we have recognized is that uh, uh, everybody is now conscious of the large amount of green investments that need to be uh, put together for the entire transition that needs to take place uh, we need to work uh, hard to get the finance in place uh, allow me to talk about how we have approached this uh, issue uh, both from a 
theoretical perspective of how we think we can uh, pull together the finances as well as a practical demonstration of what we have already done uh, with uh, creating a vehicle which is bringing in uh, green capital into the country. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my colleague uh, Anya Bhardwaj who has helped me put together this paper. Uh, I also want to uh, talk about the point that uh, Professor uh, Gallagher mentioned, uh, saying that international finance needs to necessarily step up uh, when we are thinking about the large investments that India will require as we move towards uh, the net zero that has been announced by the Honorable Prime Minister recently. Uh, these numbers range from anywhere between a trillion dollars to three trillion dollars of investments required over the next decade itself. Uh, one of the things that we've realized is that this is this transition, this financing transition uh, requires a PPP partnership. Uh, we've all been used to public-private partnership as far as many of the uh, public goods projects are concerned. Uh, but I think this transition requires a PPP partnership. Uh, there is the public aspect of it, there is the private aspect, and there is the philanthropic aspect. And let me uh, delve into some uh, details on how uh, we think about it. Uh, the public aspect is the large global multilateral institutions, whether it's the Global Climate Fund, whether it is the multilateral development bodies, etc., uh, that can pool in large uh, sums of capital coming in from the developed world. There have been uh, big promises of the amounts of monies that can flow through uh, as part of these multilateral agreements. Uh, the Honorable Prime Minister also mentioned about a trillion dollars. Uh, and as uh, Professor Gallagher again pointed out, maybe much larger sums are needed. Uh, also, where we are seeing a significant amount of traction and action take place is bilateral agreement between uh, two or few countries. Uh, we recently had uh, Chancellor Sunak talk about a billion uh, dollar plus coming in between the UK and India as part of a partnership on climate. Uh, there have been some discussions between India and the US. Uh, so to that extent, sums of monies between countries are something that we are beginning to see uh, happen. And then there are the national and the local government budgets uh, that allocate uh, funds to either new sectors or new technologies. Uh, it's also the creation of the various regulations uh, that can create the enablement of a market. It's also creating the uh, taxonomy, the point that Renita mentioned. And here I would also like to highlight the work that we at NIF are doing uh, under what we call the NIF Green Frontier Initiative. We are indeed creating an ecosystem, a local ecosystem of regulators, policymakers, lenders, uh, companies, etc., uh, and engaging deeply on various issues of regulations, uh, taxonomy, policy, etc. This is the public aspect of uh, putting together various sums of monies coming in either globally or through fiscal design of policies. Uh, on the private side, I think uh, what is becoming very clear is for private equity funds, venture capital funds, investment funds like ourselves at NIF, wherever there is a commercial opportunity, the amount of capital that is available to engage in transition related sectors, whether it is renewables, whether it's electric vehicles, etc., there is significant amount of interest and capital which is available globally as well as locally. Uh, what we are also seeing is that firms with non-green cash flows, uh, firms uh, from the coal sector, from the oil sector, et cetera, have large sums of monies that they want to deploy back uh, into green investments. And again, I'll talk about uh, how we have uh, thought about this issue as part of the green growth equity fund that NIF has helped seed. And finally, I think the third P, which is important, is the philanthropic capital. Uh, and a point that uh, emerged is that there are new technologies that are beginning to come in, which maybe the private sector is either unable or unwilling to support simply because either the technology is very expensive has a significant green premium and hence potentially is not uh, going to be uh, deployed at scale uh, given that the consumers may not be in a position to pay that price or the technology itself uh, may require a longer time period of uh, the market with respect to all the technological uh, uh, issues around it sorted out and there we are beginning to see significant amount of funds flowing through corporate social responsibility funds uh, family offices and uh, Foundations are beginning to take significant interest in uh, providing this philanthropic capital. Uh, and I'll talk about how that could potentially create a new type of instrument for us uh, to think about. Uh, quickly, just a 30-second uh, update on how we think about uh, pooling this capital. Uh, NIF has helped seed the Green Growth Equity Fund, which is now uh, the largest uh, single country focused 
uh, and climate focused fund in the emerging markets. Uh, the GGEF is uh, already a $500 million plus fund and hoping to close uh, significantly above that over the next few uh, weeks and months. Uh, and has invested across a wide range of transition sectors, uh, including renewable energy, uh, commercial and industrial segments uh, of renewable energy, the e-mobility segment, the waste management segment, etc. And within a period of two or three years, uh, I think one of the things that we have realized that there's large pools of capital that is willing to come in if the right structures are created, the right governance models are created, and the right sort of business models are back. Uh, I'll quickly leave uh, behind our thoughts on what would be potential ideas from an investor perspective as we begin to think about newer funds and newer ideas uh, to channelize all the capital that is coming in and also find the right, right risk return trade-offs. Uh, we've spoken about the idea of first loss capital, the ability to take uh, first loss on investments, whether that investment is done either as debt or as equity. Uh, and if we find a capital which is willing to take, let's say, a 10% first loss, that offers a significant uh, ability to enhance the risk return trade off for the other 90% and pools in a larger amount of capital. Uh, this is the impact capital that many philanthropies are also beginning to consider uh, as they begin to look at some of these uh, climate funds. Uh, there are guarantees as a way of ensuring that money flows in into the sectors that may require support, uh, either of scale or of technological development. Uh, there are interesting conversations uh, happening with national subnational governments, the multilateral development institutions to see how some of the sectors which require support uh, can, uh, can pool in investors and crowd in investors through guarantees uh, by some of these uh, credible counterparties. And finally, an interesting point is about having much longer duration of funds. Uh, we've been speaking of transitions uh, over a multi-decade uh, scenario. Many of the technologies that we have uh, spoken about here in this uh, conversation also, including, for example, hydrogen, have very long periods of uh, technological gestation as well as investment gestation. And so thinking about much longer time periods of funds is, I think, very important as we begin to think about uh, how we pool in capital. So those are some of our thoughts on how we see this happening. As I said, uh, significant capital available for transition uh, transition sectors uh, that are commercially viable and also for some of the sectors, uh, the, the public as well as the philanthropic sectors could come together. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Akhilesh. You're giving us uh, hope uh, that the hundreds of billions of dollars of capital that we need to deploy uh, in short order will start to flow soon. Uh, and uh, thank you for all the great work uh, that you all are doing uh, at NIF. With that, let's conclude the second section uh, of uh, this uh, panel, which is around how to pay uh, for the green transformation. Uh, and let's turn to the third and final section, uh, which is really around ensuring a just uh, and equitable uh, transition to uh, a green economy. And with that, I'd like to ask uh, Shirish uh, Sinha from uh, the Children's uh, Investment Fund uh, Foundation uh, to give us his views on how India can undertake uh, a just transition. Over to you, Shirish. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sinha, for, uh, for setting this up and also for to RF for organizing this. Um, let, let me kind of uh, take a step back and say what we are really talking about in our, our paper about a just path to decarbonize future. Um, a lot has changed and changed for India in the last few weeks, uh, a week or so, with the 2070 target now very firmly in place. And that gives us an opportunity for us to plan and look at the transition that we need to make. But if you look at most of our current framing around net zero, it's a very technocratic approach. It's about Clean energy technologies will solve the problems, 50% renewables, hydrogen coming in will address the problem. Modeling approaches will also talk about the problem, uh, will solve the problems and show us different scenarios and pathways. Financing will also address the need towards net zero. But what we miss in this conversation is that who is at the center of all of these transitions to happen? It's the people. The people who are extremely vulnerable, people who are actually being uh, you know, in the, whose lives would be impacted or, or already have been impacted in the past will continue to get impacted in future. And the livelihoods and the social structures that are built there. And that's where the core of our thinking at CIF is towards this framing around socially just transition. And that's the core, that's the key message of this paper that we have put together, together with Medulla and Kate, that what is that pathway for just, tran uh, just transition that is really needed? Um, and then I think we are essentially taking that if we 
keep this approach very much around the technical and financial solution and not address the issues related to people, uh, especially those who are vulnerable and marginalized, then we risk the, uh, derailing the progress that we may make towards climate actions and the success of that we did. So, so to, to, to a very brief, I would say that what we're taking is an approach which we are, which is extremely clear that it has to be a locally driven process, a socially just transition approach, which has to address the issue of three crucial elements. One, talking about data uh, in terms of uh, making analysis available that shows what will be the impact of the transition on jobs and diversification of opportunities of livelihood opportunities. Because many of these livelihood opportunities that we're going to talk about are nature-based and are going to be linked towards environment in, in general. The second element and pillar of the work is around equity and justice. Because unless we do not address the role that transition will have or the way it will impact both the formal and informal workforce, uh, we will not be able to make sure that this transition is equitable in nature. So and I think that becomes uh, quite an important part of it. And finally, it's the, the third pillar that we're saying is about inclusion, which is about creating a space which is equal for everyone, regardless of their social structures, regardless of their um, economic status, et cetera. And therefore, keeping this lens of jobs, livelihood diversification, equity, climate justice, and, and, and inclusion as that, as the three pillars of the, of the framework. But there are two cross-cutting areas that we believe are also very much important. And that's something which is at the core of work that we're trying to do. One is around remediation, especially, this is now you come from the district of Hazaribagh, which is partly going to be impacted from the coal transition that once it happens. The land there is no longer suitable for any other forms of transformation to happen unless you do remediation altogether, right? So I think that is going to be environmental remediation will become a major part of this just transition. Similarly, the economic transition, economic remediation, who is going to pay for this just transition? Um, Chandra Bhushan is going to speak after me. When we started working on Just Transition together with him, we basically said, can the district mineral fund be used as a basis to plan for our Just Transition in the coal mining regions of Eastern India? And the analysis that he did for Jharkhand actually gave us an answer that probably it's too small of fund that is available and can never meet it. So as uh, Akhilesh was talking about, we do need to look at financing at different levels of, from international, national and na uh, sub-national level to pay for this or to look at this transition to basically happen. And finally, I think the point that Mr. Godric made at the beginning, we need institutions or institutional structure to plan for these transition to happen. And that is going to, and we now have a legitimacy to plan and plan well for the transition that is in front of us in, in 40 odd years of time to, to achieve the next year. Let me just close and what uh, by saying uh, last two sentences on, on our approach. We strongly believe at SIF as a private philanthropic uh, foundation that what is needed now with all the new announcements and new ambition is coming up is a global just transition facility. Now, we need to define where this, what kind of this facility needs to be looked at. But at the same time, this facility has to be built on the intellectual capacity of the global south. The current framing of just transition is very much global north driven, and we need to change that narrative. And that will only come if we start to believe valuing the intellectual capital of the experts that we have, because they are the ones who understand how the populations are going to be impacted in the, in, in the, local, uh, in the local context. And therefore that is going to be uh, important. And just to end that, we say that a decarbonized world uh, will make two reasons if it is fair, equitable and inclusive, and we must work towards that and, and start working in that particular direction. So thank you very much for, for having given me this opportunity. Thank you, Shirish. And just a quick follow-up question. Uh, you know, South Africa has just committed uh, to uh, eliminating coal and uh, stopping the use uh, of coal-fired power plants for their electricity generation. Uh, and they've received $8.5 billion uh, from the global community for doing so. Now, in that facility of $8.5 billion, has there been, uh, you know, a trans set aside for a just transition uh, for looking at affected uh, communities? Uh, it is very much, uh, thank you. I think uh, that's something we have been involved in working towards to so our local partners and teams there. Um, the just transition is at the core of that facility that has been built. And similarly, other conversations are happening to the multi -development, uh, multilateral development banks. India has also signed up very recently with the World Bank to look at the just transition program. There's a very strong interest now on creating those uh, alternative funding mechanisms 
with just transition at a core of it. A lot of focus would be still on the coal and coal mining regions, but I think we need to start building up on the basis of these to look at other sectors, especially transport or agriculture, each one of them being very politically sensitive. So yes, the South Africa one includes just transition at the core of it. There are other mechanisms getting developed for Southeast Asia, for Asia, South Asia also, where just transition is likely to, it's going to be at the core of the, the facility, including the one the philanthropic community is trying to develop right now. Thank you, Shirish. Uh, and uh, in your uh, talk, uh, you mentioned uh, that we need to engage experts from the Global South uh, to uh, decide on how the just transition should happen. And we have, in fact, one of the leading uh, experts from the Global South on this panel, uh, which is uh, Chandabhushan, uh, who has uh, uh, done uh, very extensive work across India and, of course, uh, in my constituency as well, uh, on how uh, the coal economy works uh, and what um, would be required for us uh, to uh, transition away uh, from coal. Uh, so with that, let me turn to you, Chandabhushan. You are uh, our last speaker. We still have a few minutes before we wrap up and we've received quite a few questions from the audience. So I'll take a couple of questions from the audience, uh, Chandabhushan, after you finish uh, your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sinha. Uh, I'm in Glasgow and I can see the first movers club on just transition emerging right now. Uh, it is not only South Africa. Uh, which has got $8.5 billion, which is largely for social transformation. They are not talking about payment for closure of mines and thermal power plant. Uh, that discussion is happening. How will you pay for uh, you know, undepreciated asset? That discussion is also happening at Glasgow right now. But I see Vietnam and Indonesia coming forward and saying that they need a deal, whether it is a multilateral or a bilateral deal on just transition, because Indonesia has announced that it, 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 is, it can phase out coal by 2040. And Vietnam, which is currently the most, you know, fastest growing coal economy in Southeast Asia, is it has started talking about a just transition fund for itself as well. So at COP26, actually just transition has hit the ceiling right now. Everyone is talking about it. There's a general recognition that this transition is not about workers alone, which is a global north narrative, that this uh, you know, this, this, this just transition debate is about development. Now, that is now being slowly recognized that the fossil fuel dependent economies, the regions will have to be redeveloped, uh, which means that sustainable development investment is going to be most important. There's also discussion on how do you pay for plants and, uh, uh, and mines. And Indonesia, uh, interestingly, uh, Asian Development Bank has just floated a fund uh, to pay for closure of uh, thermal power plants before the end of their life. So there is a lot happening. Unfortunately, India is not on the table. Indian government is not on the table. And which is really unfortunate because at the end of the day, if, if there is a country which is going to require trillions of dollars to close down coal mines and thermal power plant and undertake just transition, it is us after China. China has money. I'm sure China will be able to get money also from outside and internal resources, but we need that kind of investment. So that is something that we need to recognize. How do we move uh, government at these negotiation to talk about difficult issues? And unfortunately, India is not at the table. Now, regarding the paper that we did uh, uh, for, for this ORF uh, compendium, uh, we basically mapped what, what just transition means for India. We are looking at about 120 districts which are going to be affected uh, because of this transition. 60 districts in this decade as, uh, will, will, will have some or other transition challenges, uh, which will have automobile districts because EVs are coming up, or thermal power district or coal districts because stabilization of coal consumption and then subsequent reduction is going to take place at, by the end of this decade. Now. We also looked at what is going to be required for this transition. And we therefore floated this idea of five R's. Uh, the first R being that we need to restructure the economy and industry. Uh, the second R being, being uh, in terms of revenue substitution, because many of these states where coal mines are there depend on coal revenue uh, for, for development. The third R being reskilling of, of labor and, and skilling of new workforce. Uh, the fourth R, which Sirish talked about it, uh, is in terms of how do we repurpose existing land and infrastructure, the rehabilitation of mine 
uh, is going to become very, very important. And the last R, but the most important R, how do we get responsible social and environmental investment and programs? Because these are also districts which are poor and polluted. And we don't want to do the same mistake we have done in the past uh, in terms of getting uh, industries which excludes people or excludes people in the decision-making process itself. So the paper basically maps uh, the requirement for just transition. Uh, uh, this, this, this is the work in progress. But my bottom line here, at least at COP, uh, it is quite clear that if India is interested in just transition, then it has to be at the table. If it is not, we are going to lose a lot. And the second point is investment is there. I just attended in the morning a bankers conference where bankers are saying that the money is available and it could also be available at a reasonably concessional loan, uh, concessional rate. But the basic issue they talked about is investment climate. Are countries willing to create investment climate to attract these funds? Unfortunately, again, on this table, India was not there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anubhushan, and uh, thank you for giving us uh, these, uh, uh, you know, glimpses of what is happening at COP26. That's uh, very fascinating uh, to know that, uh, you know, there is money available. People are uh, lining up to uh, make this possible. Uh, very quickly uh, for you, uh, as you've thought about the just transition, particularly, uh, you know, in, uh, in the sort of poorer districts of India, how do you see us developing the institutional capacity uh, to be able to pull off uh, these kinds of economic development programs? So uh, we are going to publish a paper on, on institutional capacity within a few months. But generally speaking, if we put this responsibility on current district administration, it's not going to happen. The capacity is extremely poor. So there are many models that we can look at. One is a special purpose vehicle, a SPV model, uh, which we have done in this country. Uh, then there are models of multiple institutions coming together. Uh, then there are model of PPPP. Uh, so uh, the bottom line is that the current governance mechanism will not be able to deliver the kind of changes uh, that is required in just transition, uh, both from capacity perspective as well as from bureaucratic, uh, you know, uh, the quagmire that we will get into uh, 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 in, in this entire process. So there are multiple models and we will be uh, publishing it. But just uh, I also want to add that tomorrow we are publishing our paper on global framework on just transition. So we have seen at Glasgow how bilaterals are happening. But what a global framework on just transition would look like, we are publishing our paper tomorrow. It's at 11.30 uh, uh, GMT that we are releasing the paper. Excellent, uh, Chandabhushan, and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we will need to come up with new institutional structures uh, to be able to accomplish uh, the green uh, uh, transition uh, and to be able to make it just and equitable for affected populations. We still have a few minutes and we've received a host of questions from the audience. So I'll take a few of them. The first question is for Sri Godridge. Uh, Sri Godridge, uh, there's a question uh, about uh, the afforestation programs. You said in your keynote address uh, that we need to have more nature-based solutions. What are the kinds of audits uh, and compliance efforts that are necessary to make an afforestation program successful uh, and to prove uh, that it is, uh, uh, in fact, incremental to what might be happening just normally? Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Jeff. <laughs> you know, there are many global data uh, satellite-based systems. Uh, Forest Watch is one of them. WRI has been running Forest Watch for a long time. And uh, when we look at the fact that India has been losing forest cover for some time now, you know, my question really is that when we talk of net zero, you know, where are the carbon sinks going to come from? I mean, my I've had a lot of uh, to do with uh, WWF in India and the fact that, uh, you know, forests are so crucial uh, for water, uh, for livelihoods, uh, for agriculture, for so many other uh, uh, important uh, aspects of our economy. And I think that we are somehow missing the fact that, you know, the importance of forests. So, I mean, the, the questioner's uh, point is, you know, uh, why are we not at the table 
on, on the whole deforestation pact. And uh, my answer is that uh, I think there's a not enough appreciation of the fact that, uh, you know, what the forests uh, do for the economy, for agriculture and for water supply. And so we need both, uh, you know, not just new forests being grown for uh, use in wood and pulp, et cetera. That's one aspect of it. But we need, uh, you know, heavy growth forests uh, where India's coverage is very, very tiny. I think another area is the definition of forest in India. Uh, we, we even put wasteland under forest. Uh, so, you know, these are, I think we have many, many problems to do with our, around the forest uh, related area and we need to address them all. Thank you, Sri Godridge. Uh, and then here's a question uh, for Professor Gallagher. Uh, Professor, you have uh, looked at policy packages that uh, China uh, is evaluating. Uh, and of course, China is committed to net zero by 2060. What is it that India can learn uh, from China's uh, policy thinking uh, on the net zero uh, transition? Well, what I would say is that India and China actually share many of the same challenges and opportunities. Uh, on the challenge side, both countries still rely heavily on coal. Uh, both countries have large populations. Uh, both countries are still working to alleviate poverty and bring um, their citizens uh, to a high level of development. Um, I think on the opportunity side, one thing China has been quite successful at, uh, going back to Mr. Godridge's point at the very beginning about the importance of planning, is that China is very good at developing an industrial uh, policy plan, um, deciding China wants to dominate um, you know, a certain industry like solar PV, and then putting all the pieces in place, uh, marshalling the technology, marshalling the finance, uh, getting the policy incentives right so as to uh, successfully develop an industry, create the jobs associated with that industry. And I think that many countries, including the United States and India, could learn a little bit from China in terms of how China is able to, to do this so well. But Professor Gallagher, I mean, uh, most people would say that China is much more of a command and control top-down economy. Uh, and where this kind of planning can work. Uh, the US and India, of course, are open market economies where economic activity is driven much more by bottoms up activities. Is it possible for us uh, as open economies, market driven economies to really undertake that kind of planning? Will that be useful uh, for our two economies? There's no reason why we can't plan. Anyone can plan. <laughs> um, and anyone can, can develop and pass these policies uh, the, and get the, the coherence of the policy incentives in place. I think the one institutional advantage that China has created for itself is in the development finance institutions. You know, China marshals its development banks really well. Uh, the United States doesn't have comparable development banks. And I think India's are not quite as strong and powerful and um, uh, well capitalized as China's. And, and I do think that there are lessons to be learned there. Uh, I have been calling in the United States for the establishment of a green bank in the United States for exactly this purpose. Um, and many have called for a American infrastructure bank. So that these sorts of institutions could be hugely helpful uh, in, in being able to mobilize and direct the capital uh, to the, the, the solutions that each country decides it wants to pursue. So you're saying after uh, Sally May and Freddie Mac, we should have an infra Mac as well, perhaps, because there is a, a history of creating these development finance institutions uh, in the US. So uh, no it's, reason. Exactly. It's country. certainly possible for us to do it. It's just we don't have these institutions at the national level in the United States, uh, although a number of the at the state level, a number of them have developed green banks. Oh, absolutely. Uh, let me then turn me here to you. Uh, there was a question uh, from uh, the audience uh, about uh, these uh, fast movers banding together in a climate club. 
Uh, and what uh, the uh, audience question indicated was that uh, if things are already moving uh, on their own, uh, because you know the green technologies are becoming more cost effective than the brown technologies, what is the need for a climate club? Let everybody pursue what's in their interest, and the world will, you know, by itself uh, head towards uh, net zero. Well, I think that um, the question is not just is it heading in that direction. But how fast is it heading in that direction? And I think that um, our efforts now have to be to accelerate the transition as, as, as much as possible. And for that, um, I think, yes, it is important to try and ensure that although ben both benefits and co-benefits from climate action have been demonstrated, um, that that demonstration, it becomes really so obvious that it hits people in the face. Right, and uh, we also have to recognize that we're not looking at somewhere where there, we have clean, complete markets. Our job is to try and create the markets, right? We have to, and particularly when we're talking about uh, cross-border finance, when we're talking about uh, carbon, but our job has to be to try and ensure that we create the markets that allow for um, an efficient and speedy move towards decarbonization while also respecting uh, you know, the, special uh, the special responsibilities and you know, the differentiated, especially differentiated responsibilities. But um, essentially the point here is that while it is wonderful that both technology and finance have moved so much just since Paris, that the internal motivation uh, for many companies, sectors, and governments to go on de decarbonization pathways is higher than it was then, it's still not enough. And that's why we need um, to figure out exactly how we can speed it up. So there are market failures that will have to be addressed so that we can accelerate uh, our green future. Mihir, well, well said. Uh, and now the final question for you, uh, Akhilesh. Uh, you had mentioned in your talk uh, that you're already trying to put together an ecosystem uh, of uh, participants in India, particularly regulators, uh, to start to establish some standards uh, for what's considered to be a green investment and what's not a green investment. Uh, and Renita had also spoken about greenwashing uh, as something that uh, people are often accused of. Uh, how do you uh, think that uh, we can come up with green standards in India that are aligned uh, with global standards and at the same time, uh, you know, escape uh, greenwashing? This is a pretty complicated question uh, because what is green? Uh, I think we have spent countless hours at our uh, discussions to figure out whether you want to call an industry green, whether you want to call a process green. Is it green with respect to the current reference? Is it green in the future as technologies emerge, etc.? And I think uh, across the world, uh, regulators are uh, still trying to figure out what they want to call green. Uh, on the financing side, an interesting development has happened where at least some of the bond uh, associations, bond market associations, etc., are beginning to define uh, what green means. Uh, and those are elements that are being taken up by regulators to say that, okay, if these are the parameters that are met with respect to uh, the disclosures that are being made, the sort of technology that is being put in place, or the sort of targets that are being uh, put in place and that are being audited or uh, being assured that these are being met, uh, these could be considered as green from the perspective of financing. Uh, I think the challenge uh, is moving away from a hard definition of green because uh, you will not be able to define green uh, in various contexts or uh, come to a global consensus on what is green. It is very, very context uh, specific given the sort of ability of people to spend on that particular technology, the ability to uh, implement that sort of technological uh, processes that uh, require significant capital investments, etc. And so where we are seeing the conversation change uh, is from while the taxonomy needs to be developed uh, is on two other dimensions. One is let's get the disclosures right. Uh, let's at least get the top corporates, the top investors, etc. to talk about what is it that you are doing with respect to green. A lot of that will be either quantitative to the extent that it is possible, or it will be qualitative where you at least begin to talk about your strategies, etc. And that is where the TCFD comes in, which talks about the governance mechanisms, the risk mitigation mechanisms and the strategy, etc. Uh, 
having said that, once the disclosures begin to flow through over the next couple of years, and India has put together uh, the BRSR, and sorry for all the acronyms here, uh, but SEBI has put together the BRSR framework here for the top thousand corporates to disclose what they are doing. Uh, over time, maybe we could begin to move towards target setting with respect to those disclosures as to whether can we tighten the sort of targets that people need to meet, et cetera. So this will be an evolutionary journey on defining what green is, uh, how we want to disclose, and eventually do we want to set targets. Uh, the markets are maybe one step ahead of the regulators because regulators need to be very precise with respect to definitions. Markets maybe are moving ahead to say, okay, we understand that this is green, this is solving for this particular issue, and maybe we want to support this either because uh, there is a corporate disclosure that they have done or an ambition that they have set that they want to be net zero, uh, and that's where a bunch of financial institutions are coming in to support some of these transitions. Uh, so what is a taxonomy discussion has moved a lot more to disclosures and target setting over a period of time. Excellent, uh, Akhilesh, and good to know that uh, SEBI uh, is already looking at how to establish the appropriate uh, disclosure standards. Uh, and with that, uh, to all our panelists uh, who have participated today uh, and everybody who's joined us uh, as a member of the audience, I want to uh, say a, a very heartfelt thank you uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, those of you that have joined us uh, from COP26, uh, you know, I hope uh, the rest of your uh, uh, conference goes very, very well uh, and uh, that you all continue to make great progress. Uh, this has been, of course, uh, a very rich, a very informative discussion, uh, many different perspectives uh, from all uh, the aspects of the green transformation uh, have been highlighted. Uh, and for me, the big takeaway is that, uh, uh, you know, what net zero will entail for India and for the world uh, is a complete transformation uh, of uh, our economic structure. Uh, this is uh, much bigger, uh, much more comprehensive, uh, and much uh, more en encompassing uh, of economic activities uh, than we tend to realize. Uh, and, it, uh, and it is very important for us to recognize uh, that it requires uh, all of society approach uh, to uh, deal with this. Uh, so once again, thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, and I would request uh, everyone who hasn't seen uh, the excellent compendium uh, to take a look at the detailed articles. I think uh, you'll find a lot of very interesting material there uh, and a very rich set of perspectives. Thank you all uh, and Godspeed uh, on all your travels. Bye-bye.